Hi, this is Zara Fuzzle, the voice of Halo, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 7 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, easter eggs, narrative themes, comic history, everything of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Olympia, we've been over this before. We... we have? My story must not be recorded. I have long-term plans, some millennia long. They must never risk being revealed. Tell me, why do you like the story of the bear so much? It's the only story from before your encounter with the meteorite. Before you became the savior, Vandal Savage. <laughs> it defines who... And with that heartbreaker, let's hand it back over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Evolution. The release date was January 18th, 2019. The end episode dates are that this happens on September 8th through 9th. The writer was Brandon Vietti. The director was Christopher Berkeley. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. In addition to our returning team cast from seasons one and two, uh, we <laughs> have Sarah, Sarah Fuzzle as Cassandra and Halo. Doing both those voices. We have Jennifer Lewis coming on as Olympia. David Kay uh, appears as both Steve Lombard and Vandal Savage. Rest in peace, Miguel Farrar. Thank you for your work. Uh, we have Dee Bradley Baker as both the Sod and Calabac, and Michael Leon Woolley as Darkseid. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens in a high-tech control room where a woman named Olympia hands a journal to a younger woman named Cassandra. Olympia tells Cassandra as the daughter of Vandal Savage, these are the things you should know. The journal is a handwritten account of the history of Vandal Savage, and Olympia then informs Vandal that an alien armada is incoming from space to attack Earth. Our next scene is on the beach next to what's left of Mount Justice. <laughs> Brian is skimming his phone for news of Markovia while Halo pets a starfish. And Forager communes with nature. He's having in a good interesting time. Interesting ways. He's doing his thing. He's doing it. I'm going for a scuttle. That's all I think about from Futurama every time I see somebody doing that little <laughs> maneuver. Uh, Dick arrives uh, on the beach with super suits for the new team and informs them that they will officially begin training. We then have a flashback to 50,000 years earlier <laughs> as Cassandra's voice narrates the events of Vandal Savage's past. It's got to be a record for a flashback. <laughs> Just, you know. <laughs> for Young Justice. From like 2018 all the way back to, to prehistoric times. Apparently, a meteor had fallen to Earth calling to Vandal Savage, but on his way there, he is attacked by a cave bear that gives him the trademark scars on his face that we see throughout the rest of the show. This is also apparently a story that Olympia references three more times during the episode, because it's her favorite. It's her favorite. <laughs> we then cut to the present where Vandal, Cassandra, and Olympia are tracking the Armada. Vandal contacts Lex Luthor to discuss what resources they could bring to bear on the antagonists, and the League is being kept busy on Appalachia. The Green Lantern Corps is in a two-sided conflict with both the Reach and the Light's partner, and their most powerful member, Clarion, is busy with something called Project Rutabaga. So Vandal declares <laughs> he will deal with the threat himself, because <laughs> they have nothing to throw at it. <laughs> Looks like we've done too good a job, my friend. 
a quick flashback reveals that Vandal kills the cave bear with his bare hands and a rock. Uh, as Cassandra reads, in the game of life and death, fear makes one weak. But when fueled by purpose beyond survival, man can become powerful. Back on the beach, Dick, Artemis, and Connor train Forager, Halo, and Brion. And then we skip to the outer edges of the solar system, where Vandal, Cassandra, and Olympia are in the bridge of the war world from last season. After Our Vandal issues... <laughs> yes. <laughs> the return of war world. After Vandal issues a warning to the Armada to turn away or be destroyed, the aliens accelerate and Vandal attacks. Then, 50,000 years in the past, Vandal reaches the glowing meteor, and in the light of it, he's killed by a spear thrown by a Homo sapien. In the present, the alien armada reveals a second front attacking Earth from the opposite direction that the war world cannot defend against. But back on the beach, Dick makes an analogy between the Neanderthal Homo sapien conflict and the idea of what if Batman versus Superman <laughs> had a fight together sometime. <laughs> His voiceover then narrates the resurrection of Vandal Savage as Earth's first metahuman and his dominance over the nascent human race. In the present, Vandal calls on Darkseid for resources to defend Earth, and Darkseid responds, The terms of our agreement grant you that right. Nothing ominous there. No. Uh, and with that line, we cut back to the 13th century, where we discover that Vandal was, historically, on Earth-16, Genghis Khan. We also learn that his children also had metahuman powers. Darkseid is impressed by Vandal's ability to regenerate after being killed by Darkseid's Omega Beams, and Assad, Darkseid's chief scientist and torturer, suggests that Earth's metahumans may be sturdy stock for the anti-life equation. Darkseid and Vandal form an alliance where Vandal will conquer Earth and provide metahumans to assist Darkseid in dominating the Milky Way, and Darkseid would provide resources to Vandal to achieve that goal. We then cut to Jefferson Pierce and Helga Jace out to dinner. They're having a date. There you go. <laughs> The two bond and drink and then back on the beach because we're just cutting around so much during this episode. We're, we are everywhere and it, it works, but boy. <laughs> back on the beach, Dick Grayson quotes Sun Tzu to the team, encouraging them to pick code names for the field. Halo, Geoforce, and well, Forager. He doesn't need a <laughs> Forager is Forager. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> are now officially named, and we get to see the first Maneuver 7 of this season. <laughs> In space, Calabac, Darkseid's eldest son, arrives with apocalyptic ships and a metahuman weapon that destroys the Armada's second front. As Vandal contemplates why the Armada doesn't turn away, we see one of the alien's dead bodies float by the view screen with a creature attached to its face. When Vandal recognizes the parasite, he gives control of the war world to Cassandra, and we flash back to Babylon, where Vandal, known as the demigod Marduk, fought the star creature, quote-unquote, alongside his children, Nabu and Ishtar. Nabu is killed in the conflict, but Ishtar and Marduk defeat the alien and form the light to protect and shepherd the earth. Elsewhere, Jefferson escorts Jace back to her hotel room, where the two disappear inside. Back on the war world, Cassandra detects a lone ship some distance from the rest of the armada, leading Vandal to infiltrate the ship via boom tube and cut his way through alien after alien until he confronts the star creature. The same kind of creature we saw frozen in the ice in season one, and Vandal kills the creature as Cassandra destroys the final ship in the armada. Back on the war world, Vandal places the severed pieces of the star creature in a stasis pod alongside beings like Mongol and Despero from early seasons. We come to realize that Vandal has been working to defend humanity for 50,000 years, that Cassandra and we presume the millions of children Vandal has sired over the millennia believe him to be Earth's greatest protector. When Olympia joyously declares that she will record the modern day battle with the star creature, Vandal interrupts her reminding her that they have spoken many times before about how he doesn't want his history recorded, in case it can be used to undermine his millennia-long plans. It becomes clear that Olympia has been suffering from dementia, likely for some time. Vandal asks her what it is she loves about the story of the bear. She smiles and says, It's the only story from before your encounter with the meteorite. 
before you became the savior, Vandal Savage. It defines who, and then at the peak of her elation, Vandal snaps her neck. Cassandra offers to take care of the funeral arrangements, and it is revealed that Olympia was Cassandra's sister, another daughter of Vandal Savage. And Rich dies. Let's get on to this disaster. I have a lot to say. Yep. <laughs> Dipper boy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Let's start with some stuff that you have first. <laughs> okay. Before Let's do we, that. Before we get <laughs> Let into... Let me mentally prep. <laughs> before we get into everything that you've got for this episode, because it's a lot. I have just a few little things that are fun, and most of my stuff deals with the with the team narrative this week. I love the little beach scene that we get at the beginning, not just because it's fun and cute, because you get these little glimpses into like everybody's personality before we jump into training. Like Brion is still just on his phone checking this thing that he still won't let go, and you just have Halo kind of just exploring the world. <laughs> when she says sorry, Super Suit, I just I love her so much. She's so good. Sorry, 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 Super Suit. <laughs> the best. Forager is no longer naked. <laughs> Forager is precious, and he's just mimicking the crab. I love it. He's, he's so cute. I love every scene he's in where he's like, Forager is good at this game. <laughs> <laughs> he's just trying to understand. He's a good. He's a good boy. I also. Find it hilarious to cut to Vandal, Vandal Savage's narrative for one second. I find it hilarious that the light's main problem is succeeding too much as villains right now. Right. Like, that's just <laughs> hilarious that mm. they have set this up as just, we're doing too good of a job keeping right. all of the heroes busy and it might destroy the earth today. Right. Whoops. Right. But other than that, most of my stuff is about all of these kids hanging out on the beach. I love the training montage that we get. I love that it's all of our original heroes helping the new kids and teaching them and just everybody learning together and seeing how everyone has like grown up over the seasons, seeing Nightwing get to try and train an alien and do pretty well for a while. And like Artemis understanding like what Halo needs to hear to get better, like Halo needs encouragement. And that's so good. And so cute, and I love it. I love this training montage. <laughs> <laughs> it's just good and cute and wholesome in the midst of this of this dark episode. We get these really sweet moments with all of them. But speaking of Halo, I do have one one side comment about Halo, and it's that I kind of wish she had a different costume in the show. This is the first time that we see Halo's costume, and there are parts of it that I love. Like, I love the multicolored piping that, like, mm -hmm. changes with her powers. Like, that looks awesome on screen. I love the way that they incorporated her hijab into the design of the costume and finding a way to fit that in. Yep. All of that is great, but I kind of wish that it wasn't such a skin-tight outfit, considering the yeah. fact that, like, if she is wearing a hijab, most most people who who do wear hijabs, from what I understand, I know I am not part of that religion and I'm not neither part one of, that of us community, are. Yeah. But from what I understand, that's kind of those two things don't necessarily go together. Right. You generally wear more loose fitting clothing if you are a person who also wears a hijab. Yeah, and that may not necessarily be true. And if someone has uh, some insight on that, maybe Sarah, when you're listening. <laughs> We would love to hear what your insight is on that, too, to yes. see if we're just off the mark. But Please. that was something that jumped out at me as well. I was like, oh, that is skin tight. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Like, feel free to correct us if if not. If if I am completely off base here, please or let me know. Or if we're just being cliche and stereotyped <laughs> for some reason. We don't want to do that either. And it's like, for me, it's just like a little thing. Like, I would have liked, uh, like, if they had added, like, a skirt or made, like, the top of her thing, like, a longer tunic or something like that. Right. Because uh, I know this has come up, like, with Miss Marvel in Marvel Comics. Part of the design for her outfit is that she has a longer tunic over leggings because it fits more in line with, like, how she feels comfortable presenting yeah. clothing-wise. Right. Like, you can make superhero super suits that aren't just skin-tight bodysuits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Brian literally comments on it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but moving on from that, I do love the adorable little campfire scene also that we get with all of them later in the episode, including like the little details that they throw in, like the fact that Forager eats a banana peel instead of the banana. 
(laughs) Because that's how Forager just does, because aliens. And like when Artemis jokes about how Batman and Superman could be mind controlled by bad guys to make them fight each other, Dick Grayson's just like, that would never happen. And he literally winks. He's just like, (laughs) totally winks. It's not like seven years ago we literally had to fight our mentors because of that. It's fine. (laughs) What, What I love too is the way, if you look at the transition of that scene, where he's like, oh, that Batman can beat Superman because, you know, he's smarter or whatever. Yeah. And and Connor's response is like, that's ridiculous. And it looks for just a second, just a heartbeat, that Connor's going to be like, they're going to get into a whole thing where Connor says Superman can beat Batman. And they're like, instead, they're like, why would heroes do that? That's dumb. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I love that. And I'm like, was there commentary on? Okay, anyway, moving on. It's a, <laughs> whether it's commentary or not, it's a nice little cliche dodge that you don't have both of these guys just being like, I'm going to defend Absolutely. my mentor. I'm going to defend being like, my guy. Right. <laughs> why not just friendship? The power of friendship is the most powerful. <laughs> why not just friendship has got to go on a Whelm t shirt? <laughs> If there's the power of friendship saved the world multiple times. That's right. (laughs) And I also I do like that plays into just this whole episode. I really do love the like relationship and camaraderie that we get to see between Dick, Connor and Artemis. (laughs) Like it's so good. They're all like even though they're supposed to be like the responsible adults in the room training these kids, all three of them just keep joking with each other and making like dumb hilarious jokes that i love artemis saying yeah those are dick's fancy words for code names gets me every time and i don't know why it's just so hilarious the way that she (laughs) says that line like says 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 the woman whose name is tigress and then she like kidney punches him like she doesn't just punch him in the arm she has to hit him in a vulnerable spot or nightwing's probably not gonna you know react and she and knows then she's how like, to do that. Right. <laughs> a guy who a guy who named himself after an eighties mullet band. <laughs> Which is extra funny because the Nightwing in the comics used to have a mullet. Yeah. And then yeah. he's he's just like, ha ha, that's not true. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. I love that. And I think part of why I love that exchange so much is that it feels like this is like a joking argument they've had many times. Right. Like everything about that from the way the fact that Artemis is like the phrase, those are Dick's fancy words, makes it sound like <laughs> Dick Grayson does this all the time. Right. And Artemis is just like chill. Uh, and the fact that they're able to just tease each other about their names. Right. I'm like, this is a conversation the whole team had one day, like late at night back right. at the cave. You're all just like, Let's just make fun of each other's names for five minutes. And I love it. It's that nice little friendship between all of these characters that hasn't gone away. Hashtag no powers, no problems team. They're yeah, adorable. Totally. BFFs for life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that maneuver seven was pretty cool, I have to say. It is. It is. It's nice to see how... Cause like, I'm all for the season one cheerleader throw turned into a weaponized fighting move. But it is nice seeing everybody just go, okay, but what if we add powers? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. it's so cool. And I do I do love the thing at the very end where like they've wrapped everything up. They have Dick Grayson being like, okay, we did it. Great day of training. Now everybody can relax. And then Halo has a new power. And Dick Grayson's just like, all right. We're starting over. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, let these children sleep. <laughs> yeah, it goes on for like a couple days on the beach. It looks like like they. I, I thought it was like one day, like they had one full day, but I don't know. But there was the night around the campfire, and then the thing with the we're starting over was another daytime, wasn't it? I'd have no, to go back just, and watch it. It was just more night. I was thought it? it was like they took a snack break and then they went back to training. <laughs> Oh, okay. I have maybe to look that's just my my interpretation. Maybe it could be over several because they keep flashing between this and the Vandal Savage thing, which is happening over the course of one day, it seems as well. But I don't know. Oh yeah, we'll have to look at the time stamps because it said the eighth and the ninth. I think I don't know. It like it's not that midnight. big a deal. They pass midnight. Oh, that's Again, how time works. I <laughs> <laughs> because apparently I forgot. 
<laughs> I just mean I thought it was like no, you're hundred percent right. Very early night on the ninth instead of yes later yeah, that's, that night on the ninth. I know, and I'm like, no, it must be the entire next day. <laughs> six a six a.m. is how it works. Yeah. Anyway, but, I'm yeah. feeling silly. Anyway, that's, that's most of my stuff except uh, for Vandal Savage's storyline. I think I'm uh, exhibiting some like humor defense mechanism for all the stuff I'm going to talk about. Maybe, maybe. So also at one point after the the, the point after the beach scene, uh, Cassandra says, "Vandal once wrote, it's better to capture an army than to destroy it," which is a quote from Sun Tzu. Which means Vandal was also Sun Tzu on Earth-16, which means Dick was quoting Vandal Savage on the beach to the team, which blows my mind. Layers upon layers upon layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, (laughs) there's so much going on in this episode. I mean, there's a lot of actual things that are just happening in this episode, but if you look at, if you're watching this episode, and even though that it's basically, you know, plus or minus a couple of minutes, the same length of time as like the next episode, 308, uh, that we're going to talk about next time, there's so much packed into this that it feels like it's a movie to me. Didn't, uh, didn't Christopher Jones call it the, uh, the Rosetta Stone of Young Justice? It is. It's the Rosetta Stone for the entirety of the show. <laughs> I can't believe we almost didn't get this, <laughs> you know, without a season three, <laughs> we wouldn't have understood this. The implications that Vandal Savage is the very first meta makes so much sense. It just redefines DC for me, period. But the implication that every meta is a descendant of Vandal Savage, like it's not that he was just the first meta and more metas came later. People with a meta gene not just people with superpowers, right? Because there are plenty of people with superpowers that don't have metagenes. But anybody who has a metagene that was activated is a descendant of Vandal Savage. Which makes sense because we know that there is, I mean, like on real Earth, Earth Prime, we do know that we have some percentage of Neanderthal DNA. And we know things like, well, we know that we know the research of Genghis Khan had 16 million male descendants like the study was only on male descendants potentially 16 million which is another 16 which is just ridiculous anyway (laughs) but that's just the male descendants not to mention the female descendants right and that uh, tying this all into like he is defending his children (laughs) like the whole planet i my head blew off (laughs) The the whole idea of this, I mean, and then tying it into, on top of that, tying it into named characters, like, okay, so I don't know which came first, <laughs> but if Vandal is Marduk, who I can totally be seen as a demigod or god who can't be killed, Nabu was worshipped by the Babylonians and the Assyrians, and... He was the actual son of the god Marduk. So Nabu has always been Dr. Fate's name as far as I know. <laughs> so was that something that was already established as Dr. Fate is a character, that his name was Nabu and he was this ancient spirit that was the son of Marduk from Babylonian times? And if that was the case, did Greg and Brandon Ty just decide, like, this would be a good way to kill Rich by making <laughs> Vandal Marduk? And then all those implications. And how did Naboo get into the helmet? Like, there's a, I mean, so Ishtar as well. I mean, I don't know if Ishtar was supposed to be. I didn't find anything as far as the connection of Ishtar directly to Marduk. At least I didn't find anything. If anyone else knows some secret yeah. bit of information, <laughs> please feel free to tell us on Twitter. The earliest mention of Ishtar was in the earliest story we know, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh, where Ishtar asks Gilgamesh to become her consort at some point, but when he refuses, she unleashes the Bull of Heaven, and Gilgamesh and Enkidu 
um, stop the bull of heaven, but that results in Enkidu's death, and it's a, it's a whole thing, uh, and forces Gilgamesh to kind of grapple with his mortality and who he is and what he's doing in the world. It's a whole thing. <laughs> and that story has a very personal connection to me as for me as well. Um, so I think that's another reason why this kind of feeds into my passion for the story. The light started with them. <laughs> I yeah. Okay, this isn't just a cheesy whatever supervillain name that was created when it's like we should create the Legion of Doom and stop the light. <laughs> no, this was like whatever. <laughs> but imagine a world in which their origins are exactly the same, but they came up with a name like the Legion of Doom. Instead of like something like the light with that whole history attached to it, same history, but then it's like a cheesy supervillain name, <laughs> right? Yeah, in a different universe. But this also, like the, the 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 choice of the name the light has always been interesting to me too, because I'm just like, okay, that's that's kind of a it's almost like an it's of course an ironic name in the first two seasons because they're the villains and they're calling themselves the light. That's kind of cool, and you're implying that you feel like that you're doing the right thing. By the time we get to the end of season one, we're like, oh, God, he really does feel like he's doing the right thing. Um, that's great. But the whole implication of this entire episode is that this isn't like some new plan of his. This isn't something he came to realize 50,000 years later that and only the League has stopped him. Like, no, he's been doing this <laughs> forever. Yep. Protecting Earth, his... Like, no, I own it. Like, this is mine. Not only was I here before anybody else who's alive, uh, a significant portion of them are my children. So you bet I'm going to pop in the war world and take care of business, right? I don't even know how to process so much of that. But then when I think about it, like, yes, I understand that Young Justice is, is conscious creation, right? That they plan this ahead, there's still part of me that just believes that people stumble on things as they're moving along. So when you're they're writing season three and I'm thinking like, oh, okay, I'm sure they had this whole thing with like, you know, Marduk and Nabu and they like understood this kind of aspect of the story, but this is the only time they really started putting it in there. Well, that's not true because in Sumerian myth, in Babylonian myth, Marduk kills Tiamat. It's one of the major things he does. And the the original Tiamat, where some people who play like Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy games, there's a there's a dragon named Tiamat who's like this multi headed, you know, demigod of evil dragons. <laughs> but in the actual history of the actual history, Tiamat was this water elemental. Well, that was what happened in the video game, in the Young Justice video game. This is how this is how Aqua Girl died. Was them the whole game is them researching what this great weapon was that the light wanted and it was because vandal had defeated this thing in the past and knew where to find it and yep. was trying to bring it up to maybe use it as a weapon and speaking of that guys babylon was in the middle east so they don't bury the star creature in the earth that scene where they're dumping it is in the Arctic. So he purposefully took the body of that thing and dumped it in the Arctic, traveled who knows how many hundred thousands, a thousand miles by boat during Babylonian times and dumped that star creature in the, in the Arctic to preserve it until maybe I can use this later. Life should not be destroyed while it can be used for a greater purpose. He doesn't even, do, he say, he cuts up the one that he just beat in this episode and puts it in a stasis chamber. I'm like, yep. my head, my head. Can't, <laughs> Is it in one piece? Handle this. And look, there have been, you know, we talk about, there have been 80 years of superhero stories, 80 years of effectively DC Comics levels of characters, right? Batman has had his 80-year anniversary. Superman was a few years before that. And yes, there have been these editors for the overall, you know, uh, comic companies, both Marvel and DC and, and others, where their characters cross over with each other in these big, big 
uh, like high end editors have to look at all of these things and make sure that they all kind of gel in these very complicated worlds. But having said that, those editor, it, it, it only comes into play where you have something this consistent from beginning to end when you have pretty decent sized arcs or like summer blockbuster, you know, cross title events. I mean, this is why the Marvel movies can do what they do is because they have they the, the comic people run the show for the most part and this is all they've ever done is is figure out how one something that happens in Captain America or Batman affects something that happens in Superman right but yep this is the most consistent straightforward like retelling long-term vision of DC comics and Christopher Jones is right this episode is the Rosetta stone for the entirety of the series like this is the answer to everything that's been happening and it's it's the puzzle piece that translates literally everything to the point of like i get why his daughter and other people who work with him or even his children whatever it happens to be see him as the savior of humanity because he's literally done that <laughs> dark side would have taken the planet if not for vandal a long time before now so I have moral and ethical questions in my mind about the stopping of Vandal Savage. Shout out to Ishan Sherwood. Hashtag Vandal did nothing wrong. (laughs) I, yeah, I have to, every time I watch this, I just have to process more and more of the implications of this episode. And with, and with everything that's wrapped up in this episode, because there is so much history wrapped up in this episode that we have been talking about. Uh, it reminded me how the other day, pretty recently, earlier this month, Greg Weissman had tweeted that after they have wrapped up all of all of the episodes of the season, and he tweeted that the timeline that they have, the overall series timeline, is 289 pages. Currently, before Currently. he could update it with this season's stuff. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> it's just the timeline. Like, and I think that just shows how much of this, like, there are definitely things that they probably stumbled on as they were working, but that to me shows how much of this was probably worked out beforehand. Exactly. I have no idea how much now. Because again, I'm like, okay, yeah, they probably like, yeah, Marduk and like, that's Nabu and oh, that's an interesting connection and let's do that and that kind of stuff. But like, that's not the only connection between Vandal Savage and Marduk and this series. <laughs> That's like, so much. It's not just one cool thing they threw in there to see where it would go. Like, no, it, yeah. no, it was a bigger picture. I mean, to the point where I'm feeling like we need to do a deep dive on that video game storyline. <laughs> like, we might have to. This it summer. may just be, have to be an episode. I don't know. But I know I know one thing that both you and I really liked with the Vandal Savage storyline outside of the writing was the music. Yeah, so I I mean we could dive into that a little bit here. We could keep talking about it forever for sure. But I just just we gotta reference listeners. Just go to the discussion session where we talk to the DMP, the Dynamic Music Partners, because they talk specifically about this episode and the music in this episode, and I. From a storyline perspective, when I walked away from this episode, when I stopped watching this and I just had to take a pause to process what I had just seen, and I was looking at my emotional reaction to this episode, I was like, that was more epic than I think even any DC animated movie I have ever watched. I'm walking away with this just implied and literal revelations that are coming from this, and I was trying to break down how, from a storytelling perspective, how Brandon wrote this. And then it wasn't until I was talking to the DMP crew that I realized it wasn't just that. It was these these times in space where there was no um, sound effects for the ships. And the sound effect job was being taken over by the music. And the, the, the arcs of the music they talk about and that kind of stuff, go listen to it. And I'm like, oh, that's another reason why. <laughs> I was being taken on an emotional ride with the music that I didn't even realize was happening because that's not my wheelhouse. Yep. I mean, you could probably speak to more of that because, I mean, of the two of us, (laughs) you have much more music savvy than I am by far. You are the expert in this room. (laughs) (laughs) I not, Not by a long shot, but 
Yeah, I have I have nothing to add to what they said. What they said about it is incredible. Did you notice the music? Did you is that something that you cuz I mean, look, I I watched The Greatest Showman because of you. It's a great movie. <laughs> I am singing it constantly and thinking of you and our our uh, co-editor Richard Kurtz Landry all the time doing this. And then uh-huh. of course your playlist that you've created for characters from actual plays and all kinds of stuff. Like I just don't do that. That is nothing like I know about music. So when you're watching this, did you notice this or was this something that you just took that ride like I did? It's And it's one of those things where it's been so long since the first time I saw this that I can't tell for sure anymore that like every now and then I do pick up on stuff that they've done with the music. And I think I've pointed out stuff before, like season two, Artemis and Wally had their own theme music that showed up every now and then whenever they had a moment that was really cute. Leap motifs. They're cool. Uh, but once I heard once i heard them talking about the music and rewatched the episode i picked up on everything they were saying and it i think it was a little bit like i was like huh it's interesting look the this is a lot more music than i feel like we've heard it feels epic in a way that we don't always get to see with space fights especially because i don't think the show's ever really done a space fight like that before yeah. uh but I don't even think I think I was still just taking that emotional ride because I was still trying to process everything else in the episode. Like, I don't think I really picked up on that until at least my second or third time through when I was able to be like, OK, I understand the Vandal Savage storyline. Let me see if I can take in anything else in this episode. Yeah, it's just it's a lot. It's yeah, and it's wonderful. It's such a good addition to how the storytelling works in this episode. It's yeah, those little things. Um, there's a lot I could talk about too, about the end, <laughs> just that end scene, but I have decided that I'm not going to put that in here. I have a few different things that I might continue to talk about this episode in length, maybe in short, just personal verbal essays that I will likely just release on our Patreon. So keep an eye on that. I've, I'm still processing this episode. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Anyway, so I have a lot to say in the Canary Debrief as well, um, but one thing I wanted to say that Neil had brought up um, that I had kind of forgotten about until he mentioned it um, was just the other things that make this world, make the Young Justice universe feel living, which is the real subtle drop of of Dick Grayson giving the suit to Brion and saying, oh, personally designed by fire from the Justice League. And I'm like, okay, we haven't seen fire yet, have we? Did no? we see fire at all? We saw we saw ice earlier in the season. We at did the see very ice in this season. season, and I don't think I don't think we saw fire in any of those kind of like world shattering you know events from like Revelation and other episodes in the previous season. So I think yeah. So now fire and ice have both been introduced. Who were part of the league and then also carried over to Justice League International. And so just this idea that there's even more references to even more characters that have existed, and and again, why create a new character? or a new reason, why not go ahead and name drop a character that exists and, and make the world feel even deeper, which I absolutely love. Yep. So, all right. Well, with that, let's head into the mid-roll, and then we can come back for some Canary Debrief and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, some fan service and some crashing the mode. Let's do that. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. We'd like to say welcome to our newest Patreon team member, Hunter Wilbanks. Thanks so much, and welcome to Beta Squad. I also wanted to share with you a new five-star review, thoughtful and entertaining, from Count Zane. The YJ Files is unlike any other podcast I've listened to. The hosts and guests provide interesting, detailed insight into the episodes, themes, and characters of a very special show. The sound quality and editing is top-notch. I'm always left wanting more, but unable to see where that could be possible. Thanks for the incredible show. It's inspired me to get three separate campaigns of masks together in the last month. That is fantastic. And let us know how those games go. We would love to hear it. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. All right, everybody. Uh, In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. And today there were (laughs) there were a lot of things. I actually had to narrow down what I was going to talk about today. Uh, about this particular episode. But today I'm going to talk about something that's very important to me, which is collaboration. It's no secret that Whelmed would not exist without Caleb Yambardo. Its evolution and growth wouldn't exist without Emily and Neil. Other projects I've worked on might not exist at all 
and certainly wouldn't be nearly as good as they were or are without the feedback and support and hard work of too many people to name. One of my proudest contributions to the role-playing game industry, the upcoming game Descent into Midnight, would be absolutely nothing without Taylor Labrash and Richard Grootslandry, along with the artists, editors, layout experts, and so many playtesters. My point here is this. The creative process is often seen as a lonely one. And when I first started as a writer, that was what was hammered into me, right? You're going to sit alone. You're going to do this writing. In a way, yes, that is true. Writers, artists, architects, songwriters, composers, we, we work on our projects in our own minds, in our own offices. But it's one thing that I always thought that I had to do, like that I must do this alone in order to create. And that's, that's a lie. <laughs> so back in January, Greg posted an essay to the Ask Greg website, and it was called The Smartest Man in the Room. Uh, we'll have a link to the full post in the show notes, but I want to share a bit of it here. So content warning, there's a bit of uh, language here that Greg uses <laughs> that we don't normally have on the show. So keep that in mind um, if you have uh, your littles in the room or the car. Like all YJ episodes this season, Brandon and I broke episode 7 together. A pretty even 50-50 collaboration. There were certain things I wanted specifically to see, like the cave bear, certain things I had researched, such as that in actual documented non-DC comics mythology, that Nebu was the son of Marduk, and there were certain things that Brandon wanted in there, like the metahuman kid that Calabac sacrifices. Certain things he had researched, like the Art of War by Sun Tzu, a.k.a. Vandal Savage, Genghis Khan, Marduk, etc. And together, we created a pretty kick-ass story for the episode. I don't actually remember the day of the week, but for the sake of simplifying the story, let's say we finished breaking, building the story with index cards, all neatly push-pinned into my office bulletin board on a Monday. So, Monday evening, we both felt pretty good about it. Or at least I did, and we left for the day. Tuesday morning, he comes in, Brandon, and says, something's missing. I tell him he's crazy. There is nothing missing from, <laughs> from 307. Nothing. It's a great damn episode. Maybe one of our best. Brandon says, no, something's missing. I say, what? <laughs> what is missing? Brandon says, I don't know yet. Something. Give me a day. I roll my eyes in as pronounced a fashion as I possibly can, and I say, fine. Wednesday morning, he comes in and says, I want to add a character. I'm resistant. It'll mess up the works, I tell him. But he explains, and of course, he's right, because Brandon Vietti is the smartest person in the room. The character he wants to add is Olympia. Olympia Savage. I take credit for the net first name only. That's right. In our first version of the story, Olympia did not exist. Try to picture evolution without Olympia. Be honest. It's still a solid story. A few of the actual things Olympia does, we had Cassandra doing, but otherwise the plot remains almost completely unchanged. But not the ending. With Olympia in the story, the episode isn't merely a solid Young Justice episode. It's not merely a great YJ episode. To my mind, evolution transcends Young Justice. It is a phenomenal, even revolutionary 20 plus minutes of television. And I tried to talk the guy out of it. Of course, Brandon Vietti's contributions don't end there. He wrote the script too, which is fantastic. And if you know how much he contributed to every facet of production, it would humble you. It humbles me. And as you can see above, I'm not a humble guy. But screw all that. I'm not talking about pretty pictures or color or sound or music or even dialogue. This post is only about story. And when it comes to story, Brandon Vietti will always be the smartest human being in the room. So back to Rich... The lesson of episode seven, the one lesson of half dozen things I could talk about here is do not believe you must create in a vacuum. Your work will grow and change and evolve and hopefully become more than you could ever imagine if you share the burden and the triumphs with other creative minds. All right. With that, uh, let's get on to some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. So in fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. Uh, this week, uh, I want to highlight a YouTube video from one of our listeners. It's called Batman, A Complete Character Study. And it's a video essay by Let's Take a Look, a channel created by Ben Schwartz. 
The essay explores numerous facets of Batman's character and his role in the universe, including his origin, his mission, his villains, and his allies. But Ben references professionals such as uh, Dr. Dre Aletamendi and Dr. Travis Langley, uh, creators like Greg, and media from comics and the DCAU, number of Batman films. I, I loved it. And I am looking forward to more from this from this channel. If Ben continues to do these kind of deep character dive studies uh, it, with this kind of production value, he's got something gold on his hands. So link over there and check it out. Thanks, Ben. All right. Let's crash some mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. So our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season three. In Crashing the Moon, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. These spoilers will be based only on the first 13 episodes of this season, as that's all we've seen at this time. So if you're spoiler wary, this is your warning. There's a, I got a bunch of stuff to talk about, but like, there's so much that already just is in our face <laughs> in this Appalachia. So Appalachia comes back up. So if you remember the very first mission that the Justice League worked together on was the Appalachian invasion, which were these energy beings that took over these elemental bodies. And then we ended up seeing it again in season two. Like we, we saw the statues in season one and then the leftover bodies. And then in season two, they were animated by, um, ugly Mannheim in a great episode that showed Connor being a leader for the first time and, and all that stuff and, and, and blue beetle. Yep. Okay. I were <laughs> keeping the justice league busy on Appalachia. I'm like, okay, wait, I just, there's a whole, like, ah, give me the tie in comics. <laughs> I got to know. I just I got to know. Uh anyway, Rich, of course this is what fan fiction is for. <laughs> no. We even know. <laughs> I, uh, I want to know. Anyway, uh of course uh, the radio of course mentions uh Cyborg of course Victor Stone who at the time in our scream something we were like is that Vic, is Vic coming up? Is Vic going to show up maybe in season 6 or yeah, of course. Yeah, no, we get fixed on. <laughs> and it's in like two episodes. We were like so sure, we were like, oh, that probably won't show up this season. And then it's literally like two, three episodes from now. Right. <laughs> in a uh, very <laughs> that time, Young Justice became a horror movie. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get to it. I guess let's jump ahead. That's crashing the mode for us. That's not even crashing the mode for Young Justice. That's just like crashing the mode for our actual episodes to come. It's kind of true. Yeah. Uh, you had something in here. Did you start writing something in here about Halo? Oh, yeah. This was just something random that I thought of while we were talking. Because sometimes our crashing the mode stuff happens while we are just like discussing these episodes. And then I'm just like, wait, I have a thought. Let me save that for later. You brought up the thing of how it's so cute and hilarious that Halo apologizes to the super suit when it gets thrown at her and she just kind of accidentally drops it. Uh, and my first thought was, one, as we have to say every episode, Halo's a mother box. <laughs> right, two, of course. Right. Sorry, uh, I missed that part. <laughs> but two, that's related to the thing that like on New Genesis, there are like supposedly inanimate objects that like are people. Like there are things that are not humans uh, oh. that are that, that have, are sapient like, a soul right uh, <laughs> and so soul. like it makes sense to me of the idea that halo would kind of reflexively just apologize for hurting something that she doesn't know she doesn't know how that works on earth i don't know maybe or it's just cute and it's just halo i apologize to inanimate objects too i may just be <laughs> making this deeper than it is but it's a thought that I thought I'd throw out into the world. Hey, I apologize to inanimate objects too, but I that's part of that's part of my viewpoint of the world. <laughs> <laughs> being being an animist. <laughs> that all things have something in them and uh and it it breeds respect, I think, in someone's mind, uh which I think is what Halo is doing and one of the reasons why I absolutely love that she does that. But that is you're killing me with that because that's such a good point. Just a random thought out into the world. <laughs> I love it. I 
I also had another thing that this was a crashing the mode from when I was actually taking notes on the episode. I didn't just think of this now. But so you know how we have our whole crazy tin hat theory that like there's stuff with Jace and Yeah, whatnot. the creepy the creepy stupid hairbrush thing. Yeah. Uh I had the horrible, horrible thought uh watching this again of what if Jace is only dating Jefferson so that he'll help her stay close to Brion and Halo. Uh which is a horrible, horrible thought. And I don't want it to be true, but I thought of it. <laughs> it's in the tin hat section of uh of crashing the mode. I'm just I'm just I'm, sad. I'm just shaking my head, guys. I'm just I can't. I can't tell if you're shaking your head at me. No. Or if you're shaking your head. I'm shaking at my me. head because we're gonna find out that Jace is actually a, a, a wonderful and lovely human being. <laughs> and I, I think she is uh ranking right now in my head like she, she's ranking with Vandal as the worst villain in this series. In my head canon. Like, I mean, just, we don't trust anything on this show anymore, apparently. I like trust I want I want to trust Jace. Emily I trust Vandal more than I trust Jace right now. <laughs> like Vandal, I'm like, no, no, I know what you're going to do. I, I know you. I don't know you. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, because Jace... Cause you, picked Jace up, you picked up a hairbrush and I was horrified. I don't even <laughs> know what to do with that. We're just so suspicious at this point. Yeah. Like, I want, I want Jace to turn out to be a wonderful, loving, and caring human being who is a wonderful lady scientist who just wants to help and protect the <laughs> right. world. Like, I want, I want that. I'm just so worried that it won't be true. Right. Me too. Um, <laughs> let's see. A couple of other things too. Uh, so apparently in the comics, Cassandra Savage is not a character, I think, but Scandal Savage is. <laughs> So it's such a it, name. It sounds like a supervillain name. So maybe she takes that on later. You know, Young Justice kind of merges characters together sometimes. So that might be a thing. Um, and I can't speak to Scandal Savage. I don't know anything about this character at all. Um, but an upcoming discussion session that uh, we've I've already recorded with Jared Rasher, who's um, one of the writers and the podcasters for uh, Gnome Stew on the Misdirected Mark network he comes he came on to talk about um character growth within mythology within the long-term stories of mythology which is really interesting but we also spent some time talking about scandal savage which is a character that he um connects with quite a bit so um you will be able to hear us talk a little bit more about cassandra it's more toward the end of that episode um uh, just because i i wanted to know more and i didn't know anything <laughs> about about her which was great so i i talked about <laughs> the starro thing right so starro is the star creature, you know, that they refer to in the comics. He's called Starro. So I already talked about, like, proof that Vandal knew <laughs> where Starro was to find him for all of season one, which makes me want to go back and rewatch season one just to catch if there's any other references in there. But here's my big question. Is the star creature that he fights in this episode, is it a regenerated, regenerated version of the one he defeated before? Is that why it wants vengeance and takes over an entire species of alien and doesn't stop until it wants to come and destroy Vandal for vengeance? Or or almost worse, is it an entirely different member of this mind-controlling star creature species that maybe knows about Vandal? I mean, if it is, it also implies that there are more of them, which is also terrifying. But also, if it's more... Why? Why? Why is it attacking Earth? And not just attacking Earth. It doesn't just come to Earth and try to take over. That armada was enormous and should have just annihilated Earth and taken over everything. And yeah, I don't know. Because we know one piece survived, but what happened to that piece? It's been years. It's, that was in season one. So it's been seven years. <laughs> Did it regenerate back to its full size, escape back into the space and come back? How would it have escaped into space without how did it knowing get? How did it get? To, how did it, I'm not saying nobody knew. Oh. It's been seven years. Who knows what that storyline was? I mean, it was on Star Labs had it. The light got it. The light used it to make the Starotech from season one. Who knows if, I don't know. 
Clarion went bonkers one day and was bored and was like, I think I'll send this into space. And he just <laughs> sends the piece into space to regenerate and come back. I mean, okay, I'll bring the chaos. You're right. So, I mean, who knows what happened with it? I don't know. That's why we need tie-in comics. Anyway, also, uh, last thing I have, of course, this was the first actual mention in the show. And the only one so far, I think? Yes. Of the anti-life equation. Uh, And for those who don't know, (laughs) if you check the first letters of the titles of the episodes in this season, uh, we got a leaked list of potential titles and in that linked list of leaked list of potential titles it says prepare the anti-life equation <laughs> and we've had 13 episodes half the episodes now and it looks like that leak is 100 percent correct <laughs> so also desaad and is thousands of years old like other apocalyptic people are thousands of years old uh i'm not exactly sure how to process that does that mean grainy goodness that comes up later has been around for thousands of years and that's why she can just hang on on earth for 30 years because she's like whatever it's like an afternoon for me i i mean it's fine it's (laughs) fine this is fine rich nothing it's nothing bad is gonna happen it's not fine it's It's, fine don't listen to emily it's not fine uh (laughs) yeah and we'll see what their definition of the anti-life equation is. But in the anti- the anti-life equation, um, for those of you who have seen like the Marvel movies, Thanos is obsessed with death. And in the movies, they kind of tweak it so he only wants to – he thinks he's the hero, so he only wants to kill half of everyone. They're in the universe, galaxy, whatever, to allow life to bloom and whatever, not suffer. Dark Side is obsessed with something called the anti-life equation, which he believes will allow him to control – life uh somehow unraveling the secrets of life and death it's always been vague i think this the definition of what it is is always up to interpretation i don't know what this is and particularly when desad says something like this grist for the or whatever he says what does he say do you remember <laughs> they're good sorry. grist for the mill of anti-life equation or something i don't remember something like that something like that or well, like Good stock for the anti-life stock. Equation. That's what it was. Yeah, stock yeah. for the anti-life equation. Like, what does that mean? I've been I've been dying over here for like the past two minutes. You have because been. for my own stupid reason. Because you were like, well, who knows what this interpretation of the anti-life equation will be? And my mind, for whatever reason, just went a pl- uh, a squared plus b squared equals c, c squared. squared. And I'm like, th- what are you doing? <laughs> High school algebra? What are you doing in my head right now? That has nothing to do with this comic interpretation of like what the meaning of life and death is. What are you doing here? But that I heard equation. And that was what my mind decided to supply as the next possible answer, which For is Douglas. probably the dumbest idea I've ever come up with. But I just for Douglas died Adams fans, it's going to be two forty-two, minutes. and that's why they've been like, we have the answer to the anti-life equation. We just don't know what the question was. Solve for x. Solve for forty-two. Uh, anyway, that's I think that is it for now on episode three hundred seven. Uh, Like I mentioned, once I process some of my things about the ending of this episode and some of the other things I can talk about as far as Canary debriefs regarding this episode and season's wide stories, I will get those recorded and on the Patreon. Uh, Who knows how long they'll be. They might just be five minutes of me talking or I don't even know. I don't talk for five minutes. I don't know what I'm saying. One of them is just five minutes of Rich just screaming into the void. (laughs) Yes. Not even words, just trying to process. Yeah. yeah. It may just be stream of consciousness, thought process things. We'll see. Anyway. (laughs) All right. With all that, uh, I think we can Zeta out of the watchtower. Anyway. God, this episode. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that isn't enough... You can email us directly at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats over on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions really help others find the show.
And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.